Well, good morning. It's so good that you can join us today on our um, live stream as we gather in home churches across the city and across the nation. We just give God praise for His faithfulness, for His goodness, and for His love towards us. You know, if you're in a home church today, well done to you. If you're not in a home church, I want to encourage you really to join in. Let's plug in. Let's be part of what God is doing in this season. You know, He's calling us to become disciples and disciple makers, to become His disciples by coming together in community together, fellowshipping together, walking together, but also to be disciple makers, going out to reach the lost and going out to see lives transformed. What a great baptism we had last weekend, you know, as we were just celebrating those that have come to Christ and them coming yeah, and getting seriously wet in the water. We were so encouraged by that and I hope you were blessed by that. I just want to encourage you right now. Let's be church together. Let's be family together. And if you're in a home church, that's the place to be. That's where we, we become family. We knit our hearts together and we learn and grow together. Amen. Just to remind you in your home church is about a thousand smiles which will be starting, which will be coming up soon. If you haven't discussed where this is going to be as a home church, where you're going to go out missionally as a home church, I want to encourage you to do that today. You know, just pray into those areas, pray into where God wants you to go. And, you know, um, by now you should have requested how many bag bags you need. Um, and if you haven't, please send that message across to um, the, the um, to Jeff Shirt, who is in charge of the Thousand Smiles, and let him know how many bags you need for your home church. Because this Christmas, we want to be missional. We want to go out and we want to see the lost saved. Amen. Well, also as well, we know of our Christmas mission, we're doing Love 316. So if as a home church, you know any family in your area that needs a gift at this Christmas time, please send that name, those names into the office. We would love to be able to bless them with a gift, a hamper, or if they are children, with a gift, a Christmas gift over Christmas. And But we need those names. So please, please, if you know anyone in your areas, send those names in, send an email to the office and they will be glad to, to um, process this and to get a Christmas gift to them in December. Amen. Well, we're looking at our next chapter in Acts, which is Acts chapter 7. And it's a follow-on from Acts chapter 6. It was so great. To, um, we weren't there on that Sunday, 24th of August, October, um, but it was so great to listen to um, the Word of God as Blessing brought that word, just talking around Stephen and how, you know, service is really the key for our lives. And you can never be too anointed to wait on tables. You can never be too anointed to serve. You know, service is what Jesus did. He laid that example for us. And the question I want to ask you is, where are you serving right now? Where are you serving? If you're in a home church and you don't know where to serve, ask your home church pastor. Ask someone there, you know, where can I serve? Where can I get involved? <clears throat> you know, there's so many opportunities for us to get involved, whether it's by serving practically in the house or actually serving missionally as well, going out. But God has called us all to be the body of Christ. We all have a function. The question I want to ask you, what is your function? What are you doing? How are you contributing to the kingdom of God? So as we looked at that in chapter 6, it leads nicely on to chapter 7. And in a moment, I'll invite you as a home church to read chapter 7 together. But just looking over it, you know, that we see the, 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 the end of chapter 6 sort of leads into chapter 7. But we see Stephen here and Stephen is, is, is um, bringing um, a, a testimony of what God has done. He's giving a story of what God has done, even at the end of his you know, when he's being questioned and he's being falsely accused. But let's read from Acts chapter 6 and verse 11. In verse 11 says, Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blas blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen 
and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses to, who testified, this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. Can I just lay a foundation here? The Bible says there were false witnesses, that Stephen wasn't saying those things, but they made up those charges against him. But then we pick it up in Acts chapter 7. And Acts chapter 7 is where the, um, the end of the witness in Jerusalem happens. You know, and we look at it, um, and we look at, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of Acts that Acts is broken into three. So witnesses to Jerusalem, witnesses to uh, um, uh, Judea and Samaria, and then to the rest of the world. Acts chapter 1 to 7 is witness, is the apostles witnessing in Jerusalem from verse 8 to 13 now to verse 12 is the witnessing in Judea and Samaria persecutions scattered the church there and then from verse 13 we see Paul's missionary journeys going to the rest of the world but when we read in Acts chapter 7 we see that we find that that you know Stephen begins to remind those accusing him of their history he begins to tell his story <coughs> he begins to tell them of where the Lord brought them from and where the Lord, what the Lord has done in their lives. And I just want to encourage you today to remember your story. Remember your story. You know, God has done great things in your life. He has redeemed you. He has brought you from darkness into light. And right at that point of Stephen being falsely accused, he could remind the people there of their story, of, of his own story as well, because he was an Israelite. So he could tell them of what God had done in his life. And he goes through, you know, I'm not going to go through that. You can, when you read the story together in your home church, you can, you can look at that, what the, what the steps were that, that um, uh, Stephen emphasized that God, threw, uh, God took them through. But actually, we see that every one of us has a story. Every one of us has a story of where God has brought us from. And it is important for us to remember that story. Whenever you are faced with a challenge, remember where the Lord has brought you from. Remember what the Lord has said to you. And that's why I've titled this message today, Remember Your Story. Remember the story that God has brought you, uh, has given to you. Your testimony is your greatest evangelistic tool. And I want to encourage you in your home churches to share your story with one another after, we, after you've read you know, the, um, the, the, the chapter together. Let's share a story. Let's tell one another of the things that God has done. You know, some of you might have great dramatic stories and great dramatic testimonies. We've heard some in the last few baptisms that we've heard, how God has transformed lives from darkness to light, you know, from depression to, to, to freedom, from darkness of, of drugs and addiction to freedom from that. And just fantastic testimonies. But some of your testimonies might not be that dramatic. They might not be that, you know, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, eventful. I have a, a very um, a quiet testimony. You know, I gave my life to Christ quite at an early age, and I didn't go into all those um, things, worldliness that many others had had, had been prayed, um, had been pulled into. And God saved me, delivered me from that. But then I began to research and I, th and I began to say, actually, there's more to my testimony than just my lifetime. There's more to my testimony than what God has just done in my life. There's actually a history of my life that God has, has orchestrated and has designed. And I began to look into that. And I just, just to a brief uh, 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 background of my history, you know, my great, great grandfather was Henry Thomas Peet. He was born in 1841 and he was born in a town in Essex you won't believe that you know uh, my history is, is from Essex you know and he married his um, Lucy Eagle in 1839 and she was born in Essex as well too they had three children Annie Nettie and Henry who was my great uh, great grandfather then but then you know they um, uh, uh, he was into the, the shipping business into building boats but then my uh, and he trained my gra great grandfather into that Henry Holt 
Pitt, who was my great grandfather in 1871, um, began to look after boats again. He began to do that from his childhood in Strangford. And he went to sea. He later became a pilot at the port of Belfast. That's how my history comes to Northern Ireland. But he ends up in, in the port of Belfast as a pilot. And he was um, married to a Ball Walter girl, Margaret McClough, in, in Ball Walter Pre Presbyterian Church. So they were Christians all this while. They had four children, Edwin, Lucy, Henry, and William. And, the, um, uh, and um, Lucy became my grandmother. Um, on my mom's side. You know, they are all godly. They brought up their children in a godly way. My grandfather then, who was called Joseph Alexandra Mitchell, was born in Bell, um, Bali Mena, Northern Ireland. He was a businessman and he was a commercial tra traveler of a big Scottish company. He was a Christian brought up in a very strict home um, of the exclusive Plymouth Brethren. He probably gave his life to Christ, you know, as a child. Um, but my grandmother, his wife, prayed so much for him to, um, to play less golf. He was a, a golfer. He loved playing golf. But she prayed so much to play less golf and that he would really follow the Lord um, closely. And then something happened. He had a great experience of the Holy Spirit while he was in hospital when he had scarlet fever. And that, that experience with the Holy Spirit transformed his life. He felt God's call on his life and stopped golf altogether. And he began preaching and testifying all over Northern Ireland. What a great testimony. What a great heritage. I never knew that I had a preacher in my home. You know that. He began to preach and, and to testify all over Northern Ireland. And God told him that all three of his children would serve God as missionaries. And that happened. All three of his children, Oswald, Alistair, and Margaret, who is my mom, all served God as missionaries in different parts of the world. That experience with the Holy Spirit transformed the home. And my mom, who was just one year old when that experience happened, was told by her mom that it completely transformed the home. That word from my um, from the Lord to my grandfather Joseph went on to inspire his children to be missionaries and Margaret my mom went to Nigeria first in 1962 as a missionary she went there as a missionary teacher to a women's teacher training college in eastern Nigeria but after a few months after about nine months she was transferred to a mixed secondary school to teach there um, for one term only initially to to relieve another missionary teacher who was going on leave and in that school was where she met my dad wow what a great connection that the Lord does. He connects the dots together. He brings people. The story goes beyond, goes past your lifetime. It goes far beyond that. So God's word comes to my great, my, my grandfather to say his children will be missionaries. My mom goes off as a missionary to Nigeria and is uh, posted to a school where there are no men. But then something happens one of the teachers gets pregnant and she's transferred to this other school and she meets my dad there but my dad on the other hand who went to a teen and uh, um, secondary school and that's where he met my mom he had gone on to university and and, and had become you know a, a a a student there but then they carried on in communication all that while they carried on, but he's just going to my dad's history. My dad, you know, he became a Christian while in the school, while at the secondary school, and often interpreted for um, the missionaries when they were preaching. What a great history. He was one of the people there interpreting the gospel for the, the missionaries out there. And, you know, that um, they got married in 1971 in Nubusa in Nigeria, in the northern part of Nigeria. But then in July, on July 31st in 1973, while he was on a scholarship to do his PhD in Toronto, Canada, he had a terrible nightmare when he believed he was being killed and immediately left all Christian worship and followed his mother in traditional religion, worshiping water spirits. That was a dark time in our family life. 
he that continued for 20 years until he attended a full gospel businessmen's outreach uh, um, in August of 1993. So for 20 years he was away from the Lord. It was a de- I was born into that. But then in 1993, a student, a fellow student who was at the same university as he was, who had become an evangelist, preached the gospel and my dad went forward for that altar call and, was, and gave his life back to the Lord. And he followed the Lord until he passed away. What a great history. And then I came into the picture. I came into the picture in 1979, not knowing all the history from the 1800s of how God had led and how God had been part of this. And I just thought, you know, I was born into this home and just lived my life. But then that history followed me. That call that God had placed on that family line was still there. And, you know, at 13, I gave my heart to the Lord. And minding my own business, God caught me and connected those dots together. And then a few years later, I met a, a girl called Rachel, who is now my wife, my beautiful wife. You know, I met her and she said, oh, you know, that I'd love to do a master's in the UK. You know, that, and I had no plans of coming to the UK. I had no intention of doing that. I was happy in Nigeria doing what I was doing, oh, running my business. But then God connected next that dot and he says actually you need to be in the UK and then a few months later we find ourselves in the UK and in Derby where we had no one no history God connected that dot brought us to Derby and to new life where which we found on on the yellow pages God connects the dots and now we end up leading the church here coming back as a missionary to the UK God sent um, my mom over to Nigeria as a missionary and now her son has come back to the UK to be a missionary to reach the very people that God had called had sent has sent her from But actually what we find is that we all have a story. You have a story, a story of God's redemption, a story of God's faithfulness, a story of God's provision, a story of God's healing, a story of God's miraculous intervention. We all have a story. You might not be able to trace it as far back as I did to your great, great grandfather. But if you would, if you, if you look far enough, you will see the finger of God in all of it. Stephen in this chapter was able to look back and to trace back God's faithfulness and God's plan of salvation for his people. He began to talk about his plan of salvation and he went right back to Abraham and he began to talk about that. But we actually see that God's plan of salvation goes right back to the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3 and verse 14 to 15 it says, For the Lord God said to the snake, Because you have done this, when he was cursing the snake, He says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Another version says, he will bruise your head. That's her seed was Jesus. The plan of salvation was already given right at the fall of man. He was predicted to come right from the beginning. We see that plan unfolding in the New Testament. You read the Gospels, you see that plan. But in John 3 verse 16 to 21, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear of their deeds will be for fear that deeds will be exposed but whoever lives 
in the truth comes into light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Wow. God's plan of salvation is for you today that you might come into the light. If you don't know God today, His plan is for you to realize that He loves you so much and He brings you into that light. And in your home church, it's just going on. I just want to encourage you to read through that book of Acts, that chapter of Acts, chapter 7, and discuss these questions. What does this passage say about God? What does this passage say about man? What is your story of God's faithfulness and redemption? And I want you to go around the room. Tell your story of God's faithfulness, God's redemption how he saved you, how he transformed you. And then who are you going to tell this story to this week? Who are you going to tell your testimony to? Who can you speak about God's redemption power to this week? If you're not a Christian today, I'd love to pray with you because his redemption power is there to transform your lives. And all you need to do is say a prayer, a simple prayer, just inviting Jesus into your heart and that's what unlocks his redemption in your life and that changes the history of your life forever. You might be the first generation Christian in your home, that doesn't matter. That's what God wants, that you are the first generation of Christians in your home. He wants to love you, he wants to show you his faithfulness and his love, hallelujah. If you're not a Christian today, I want to lead you in that prayer. But if you're a Christian today, you can pray that same prayer as well. If you've gone far away from God and you want to rededicate your life, you can pray that prayer as well. God is close and he wants to hear you pray that prayer and to come close to you. Will you join me this um, today right now as we pray this prayer of salvation? Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I thank you for the story that you have given me. And I thank you for your plan of salvation. I ask that you come into my heart. Take my sin away and give me new life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and transform my life. I turn away from my sin and I come to you. I ask for forgiveness. Forgive me all my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love you, if you're in a home church, to speak to your home church pastor straight after this. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer, I'll encourage you to put something in the comment section. Tell someone about what God has done in your life. Let us be able to support you. We would love to get some of your details so that we can send you some resources that will help you along this journey. But it's been great that you've been able to watch this. I pray that the rest of this time in your home church will be a blessing as you talk together, as you spend time just um, um, searching the scriptures and let God reveal to you all the truth that he has for you. God bless you and it's been great to speak to you.